here. So let's start and hopefully we can stay on schedule. Cool. Okay, so yeah, welcome everyone. Um, this is the first um, Modern Analytics Academy webinar that we're running um, with Google Cloud. Um, and it's the first in a series of three webinars to start with. Um, I'll talk a bit more about that later, but um, yeah, we're running them every Tuesday for the next three weeks. So um, there'll be more information on, on that um, later on, but yeah, so welcome everyone. Um, before we begin, there's just a few kind of guidelines that um, I wanna go through um, just to make sure that we're running these kind of as smoothly as possible. It's our second, virtual meetup event so we're still kind of figuring out the best way of doing it but yeah hopefully we're we're, we're learning each time what works and what doesn't so we've moved from hangouts to zoom hopefully that makes it a little bit of a nicer experience for everyone um but yeah just a couple of kind of guidelines please can you make sure that you stay muted throughout the talks um if it's possible to have your camera on then please do we find that it kind of yeah, it's nice to see everyone's faces and it feels a little bit more human when we can see everyone. Um, we'll have a kind of dedicated time to ask questions at the end of the presentation um, where you can either choose to um, just write your question in the chat um, and I will read through them um, and ask them for you. Or if you'd prefer, you can just simply unmute yourself um, and ask a question. I think there's there's enough of us that that can still work. Um, if we find that people are talking over each other, we can maybe just writing them is better. But for now, let's say that you can just unmute yourself and ask if you want to. Um, I'm gonna be, we're recording this session and we'll probably send around a, a copy of the recording to everyone who's attending um, at the end um, of the session. So yeah, if you find it useful and you wanna share it with anyone, then please um, do, we'll send that around to everyone at the end. Um, cool. So. Let me just talk a bit about the agenda for today. Um, so first up, we've got Dan Lee, who's head of data at Dataform. He's going to be talking um, a bit about why you should build a single source of truth in your warehouse um, and why we recommend an ELT approach over ETL. We then have Vince Gonzalez, who's a strategic cloud engineer at Google Cloud. Um, and he's going to be focusing more on um, specifically on BigQuery and why they consider it an excellent choice for the ELT framework, their perspective on how kind of cloud data warehouse is changing and why modern data teams are moving to an ELT approach um, and then what this means for the, the future of data teams. Um, so just a little bit of background on the Modern Analytics Academy, what it is, why we decided to produce it. Um, we worked with kind of a number of different data teams um, over the past two years um, who were working with kind of vast amounts of data. Um, in today's world, like data powers the modern organization, every event is tracked, um, organizations have huge um, access to huge amounts of data, which is obviously a blessing and a curse for data teams. Um, they were now kind of in charge of having to satisfy the entire organization's um, demand for uh, like data driven decision making and the complexity of the data sources that they were working with was growing and growing and it basically put them in a kind of extremely difficult position and called for a new way of working which we call modern analytics. Um, modern analytics basically uses the technologies and workflows of software engineering to deliver the analytical outcomes demanded by the modern organization and we consider modern analytics to be scalable agile and collaborative. Um, and so from speaking to kind of various different data teams and um, identifying patterns in, in the ways that the best data teams worked, um, all of this knowledge we were kind of consolidating in our head and we decided that we wanted to make it more accessible to everyone um, and put it into lessons, uh, bite-sized lessons, and we wrapped it up into the Modern Analytics Academy. Um, so we launched this a few weeks ago um, with four lessons. We kind of started with the fundamentals and we're hoping that we'll add to it. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll produce more and more um, content as, as time goes on. Um, yeah, the four lessons that we launched with were um, an introduction to modern analytics, um, a chapter on 
why we think modern data teams are moving to an ELT approach over an ETL approach, um, a chapter on data modeling and building a single source of truth in your warehouse, and then a chapter on data quality testing um, and how we think you can use assertions to do that. Um, like I said, we kind of launched with the fundamentals and we're hoping that we can produce more kind of complex content as time goes on. Um, yeah, if you subscribe to the Academy, you'll get new content straight, straight to your inbox. And as part of the launch, we are running a series of webinars with um, analytics leaders in the data space, um, kicking off with this one. And then over the next um, few weeks, we've got one next Tuesday on why your organization needs a centralized data model, um, which will be running with Sadat, who I think is on this call today, um, who's uh, the founder of Modern Data Sciences, who are a data consultancy. Um, and then we'll be talking about um, building trust in your data with automated testing um, with Sean from Cisco Meraki, um, who has basically um, built out a kind of data quality testing framework from scratch at Cisco. Um, and we'll be talking about that. Cool. So I'm going to hand over to Dan now, who's um, yeah going to start talking about why modern data teams are choosing an ELT approach. Great. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Yeah, nice. So yeah, as um, just said, I'm Dan, head of data at Dataform. Um, Dataform is a product that helps teams manage data in cloud data warehouses. We'll talk a little bit about that later and um, kind of a bit, a bit more throughout the rest of the webinar series. Um, I've been at Dayform for about a year and a half um, and a fair amount of my time and energy over the last couple of weeks and months has been spent trying to put together the content for the, for the Modern Analytics Academy, which has been a fun challenge. It's been, it's been pretty tricky, but it's been a great exercise to, to kind of force us to take some of the things that we, that we think are important and try and put those things down into words and make sure they make sense when you put them down on paper. I think generally speaking, they do. Um, so yeah, this presentation, of course, is covering the central topic for the first chapter, which is ELT and, and why we think it's um, the approach, the right approach for, for data teams today. So yeah, Josie teed this up quite nicely, but um, and, and I'm sure everyone here is um, pr pretty, pretty aware of this situation, but the role of data teams has, has, I think, never been more important. It's the heart of the modern organization. Um, almost every organization across across the every almost every team across the modern organization relies upon data um, and it's it's kind of yeah core to almost all decision making um, but with this increased um, responsibility of the modern data team there's also um, obviously um, a lot of complexity so the, the data team is working with a variety of different teams um, as well as with a variety of different data sources of growing size and complexity, um, which means that the scope of the role for the data team is continued, continually increasing, um, which is a great opportunity, but yeah, as Josie suggested, causes some challenges. So data teams are looking for ways to work smarter to, so that they can keep up and um, meet the demand that's been placed upon them. Um, and when I say work smarter, I'm talking about things like increasing automation, reducing time spent on kind of toil or manual work, um, increasing collaboration across the team. As the data team gets bigger, it's really important that the team, the data team can work together and be kind of force multipliers within, within themselves. Simplifying processes, again, this is kind of part of that automation, but making sure that, that the team isn't spent on, on kind of complex processes that aren't really adding value to the business. Um, and yeah, reducing cycle time. The more, the more demand there is for the data team, the more important they are in decision-making, the more important is the data team can respond quickly and keep up with the pace of the business, which is always as fast as possible. Um, so yeah, all of these things really are about being a bit more agile. Um, and yeah, I think this is something that, that that's going to be really important for data teams already today and going forward. So where are the opportunities for the data team to work smarter? Of course, there are loads of opportunities, but um, but to kind of tee up the rest of this um, presentation, let's, let's think of the data, team, data team's workload at a very high level as kind of having two parts. There's making data uh, available and useful. And then once you have that available and useful data, typically in the data warehouse, I'm kind of skipping over the, the preaching that the data warehouse is a great place for housing your data. Um, 
But once that data is available and useful in a data warehouse, then the data team partners with business partners, business teams, and helps them kind of make sense of it, use it to drive operational decision making, even kind of um, potentially um, uh, powering kind of products and, and services within, within a company. But so kind of two steps, make it available and useful, um, and then go on to make data-driven decisions. Um, for this talk, I'm going to be focusing a little bit more on the making data available and useful. Um, in future webinars, we'll start touching on a little bit more of the second part, and that's also something we plan to expand on a little bit more um, going down the line in the Modern Analysis Academy. So making data available and useful. Um, typically, this has been kind of all bundled up in, in the uh, three-letter acronym ETL. So um, what is this ETL thing? ETL stands for Extract, Transform, Load. I'm sure, yeah, it's something that you've probably all heard, probably even um, know kind of what the details are. Um, this has been the traditional par paradigm for, like I said, at a high level, taking data and, and making it useful. So extracting data from some um, source system, um, storing it in some temporary location ready to then transform, performing a bunch of transformations, aggregations, filtering, um, reduce it, you know, removing any erroneous data, cleaning it up, and then once it's kind of ready, um, transformed, useful, enriched, then loading it into um, the, 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 the place where the data can be accessed, in this case, the data warehouse. So EL2 architecture, yeah, take some raw data, clean it up, this um, nice prepared data, load into cloud, cloud data warehouse, then it's available for BI tools and advanced analytics kind of makes sense um, as presented like this, but unfortunately there are a few issues. So the first problem that I wanna talk about is um, the fact that analysts are kind of locked out um, of the transformation process in the setup. Performing transformations to data in flight pre-warehouse is, um, is, a, is a complex task. It often requires engineering to, skills like um, being able to write programming, use programming languages like Java or Spark. Um, and unfortunately, this means analysts who, who typically don't have those skills uh, um, can't really contribute. Um, the analysts don't really have any visibility of the logic that went into that transformation layer. And this is particularly frustrating because it's typically the analysts who are in the best position to know what transformations will make sense and make data most useful. They're the ones that are partnering really deep with the business. They know the kind of questions that get asked, and they also have a really good sense of what transformations to source data, what kind of joins, um, what aggregations are going to um, enable uh, downstream insights. So that's kind of a problem that the analysts can't really help out with that transformation process. Another problem is that um, transformations, that essentially kind of application of business logic, are generally data source specific, um, and they will require some input from business to understand what needs to be done. What, how do we define a user in this particular system? What exactly does constitute bad data? All of this stuff is really um, source specific business logic. And so, um, you know, all of the, defining all of this is complex and time consuming. To, to get this right requires co collaboration for, between the engineering teams who understand the source data, um, the analysts who kind of are the go between between the business and, and the data, as well as the business teams defining, you know, how do we define um, monthly recurring revenue? How do we define um, a new user? And that collab collaboration is time consuming. Um, and therefore, uh, in, an ET in an ETL setup, having that defined, all of this needs to be defined before that data can be integrated into the system. And because it's time consuming, unfortunately, this often means um, it, it just doesn't get done. And so your data warehouse ends up being a containing a subset of the available data and, and the truth. So the reality of a, an ETL architecture is something like this. The analyst impact is kind of limited. They are dependent upon the sources of the data that are available to them. They can't really have too much input. They don't really have visibility or, to the logic that was applied before that data was loaded into the warehouse. Um, a lot of time is spent back and forth communicating between the two teams. So engineering teams, um, you know, do their best get to get that data available. The analyst teams start doing some work. They realize there might be some problems. They let the engineering team know. The engineering team can then go and try and make some um, changes and some updates. And all that back and forth is, of course, wasted time, not, not particularly agile. Um, and because 
because there's so much time required up front to on onboard a new data set um, and a, oftentimes a business case is required it just means that many data sources are left out so the yeah as, as i kind of said the data warehouse ends up being um, only only containing a subset of available data of course this means that your organization unfortunately is not maximizing the, poten the potential of its data grammatical mistake there apologies so given those problems, why does ETL exist? Well, um, there's, a, there's really two reasons. One of them is that storage in a data warehouse is expensive. Before loading data into the warehouse, um, this ETL process gives you an opportunity to filter it down, aggregate it, reduce its size, and therefore reduce these downstream storage costs. Um, and computation in the de data warehouse um, can be slow. So again, Rather than performing these transformations later, we need to do them with technologies like Spark or Java, um, uh, MapReduce, um, so that we can, so that we don't have to rely on the slow warehouse. Well, I think you're probably all pretty aware that this is not really the truth now. That was the case, and these were the kind of assumptions that we had when the ETL architecture, you know, was built. But the reality now has changed quite significantly. Um, cloud data warehouses have completely changed the, um, the game and no longer is storage in a data warehouse expensive. Instead, it's incredibly cheap, indeed free if you're you know, just starting out and you're a small team. And computation in the data warehouse now has caught up with and indeed oftentimes overtaken some of those previous technologies. So the kind of fundamental assumptions um, or kind of um, yeah, the fundamental assumptions have changed. Um, and the other thing that's really exciting about cloud data warehouses is that they scale really well. So these assumptions have changed not only for really large organizations, but also for really small organizations. So what does this mean? Um, this has led to the rise of ELT, the, the subject of the talk. So um, nothing too complex here, ETL, extract, transform, load, ELT we're swapping the transformation and the load step. So rather than performing a transformation before loading data into the warehouse, we're instead doing all that transformation work after loading into the warehouse, moving the transformation, um, uh, processing into um, you know, BigQuery, Snowflake, whatever that cloud data warehouse is. Um, as you can see here, this kind of changes a little bit how teams can um, collaborate across, across that um, architecture. So with extract and load, not really in, involving too much transformation, it becomes simple. Um, most of the inter integration use cases can now actually be supported by SaaS platforms. So you don't even necessarily need to bother your engineering team before getting some data available in your warehouse. Instead, you can use tools like Fivetran and Stitch, which have um, essentially commoditized the uh, data integration process. And for transformations, of course, now that we're doing all of this transformation in the data warehouse, um, there is a need for some tooling to help manage um, this new workload. And what we're seeing in the space is a new generation of SQL-based tooling, which is built for analysts to be able to contribute and work alongside engineers on managing in-warehouse data transformation. Um, Dataform, um, with the, the company I work for, is working on one of the platforms that helps with this and there are other, others available too. So kind of summarizing some of the implications of ELT, um, it kind of simplifies things. Postponing the T means that integrating data into the warehouse becomes business, essentially business logic agnostic, which, which paves the way for third parties to provide SaaS plug and play data integration tools. Um, everything becomes a bit more agile. Again, business logic is being moved down um, into a later stage of the process. Um, so it can kind of be applied at the point of use. When your company starts using a new source of data, this can be pretty much integrated from day one, open up Fivetran, um, switch on the integration. Even though you don't necessarily need to start using it yet, three or four days down the, three or four weeks down the line, or maybe months down the line when someone in the business says, oh, um, it'd be really interesting, interesting to see how many subscriptions um, you know, we get per week in Stripe. The analyst doesn't need to kind of file a ticket to the engineering team. Instead, the data is already there, it's ready to go, and they, and they can kind of get straight on with um, helping the, the, the business partners. 
And it also opens the door for more deep self-serve analytics. So now that we have the raw data available in a data warehouse, um, BI tools can be used to drill down from those aggregated reporting tables down into detailed summaries of the raw data underlying them, which is enabling a deeper level of insight within the analytics community. And kind of so, so that was kind of the impact for the um, from a process perspective, but for, from a team perspective, this is pretty interesting too. Analysts now have visibility of all the available data and they're empowered to explore freely across, across all of the data the organization has. This is the thing that analysts are really good at. They're great at like exploring, um, you know, um, finding insight where, where, where it wasn't really known before. What, what, what doesn't really work very well for analysts is saying, tell me the data you need so that you can go and um, you know, answer this question for me. What analysts are generally pretty good at is like, oh, here's like 20 data sets. What are the interesting things I could do with that? Let me play around. Let me do some exploratory analysis and, uh, and see if there's something I can learn. And now that's possible because all that data is available, easily accessed with SQL in the data warehouse. From an engineering team perspective, this is also good news because um, they can hand over own ownership of business logic not particularly something the, business, the engineering teams want to um, manage. Instead, they can focus on more demanding kind of data infrastructure challenges. And from a business partner perspective, um, again, this is looking much better for them because rather than having to wait for that back and forth between the um, analysts and the engineering teams when they, when they have some new question or they want to you know, answer, uh, um, ask some questions that involve a new data source, instead the analysts are empowered to go all the way to source data um, kind of create their data sets, perform those transformations on their own. Um, and so business partners can get their answer, questions answered in minutes. You know, maybe, that's, maybe that's optimistic, maybe it's hours or, or days, but, but certainly not weeks. So in summary, data teams um, are looking for ways to work smarter. The ETL paradigm was actually slowing teams down and the reasons it developed no longer even held. Um, and so we're seeing modern day data teams transforming their data in the warehouse following what we're calling the ELT paradigm. Um, and um, fortunately, you've got companies like Dataform working on this new wave of platforms that are built for ELT. Um, they're SQL based um, in warehouse and specifically designed for analysts to, to manage its transformation um, workload. And with that, I will hand over to um, Vince. And yeah, I think if, if there are questions, we're gonna, we're gonna um, take those together at the end. Hey, thanks, Dan. I'll share as soon as yours uh, stops. Here we go. All right, so uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Vince. I am a strategic cloud engineer at Google Cloud. I've been here about four years. Uh, I'm a member of our professional services organization. And what I do here is uh, work with customers who are uh, building data solutions on, uh, on Google Cloud. So why would you choose BigQuery uh, potentially as a platform uh, for ELT? Um, first, I think it probably makes sense to start out with a little bit of background as far as, uh, you know, where BigQuery came from and, and, and what, what, what problems we're trying to solve with it. So traditional data warehousing looks something like this, right? We've got um, uh, SQL capabilities. Uh, we've got some, some sort of management software that's given over to uh, managing our data warehouse. Uh, your data stored on uh, durable storage in some kind of a table abstraction. And then you use compute to, um, to actually execute your queries over, uh, over, over your data that's stored in the storage. What, um, what BigQuery does is bring this, brings this to the cloud. Um, and we're bringing this sort of traditional data warehousing capabilities, standard SQL, uh, your data in table abstractions, uh, scalable compute, but adding uh, some things that reflect the ways that data warehousing is actually changing these days. Um, so I think people are expecting more to be able to do more with uh, with their data, and um, and we've built BigQuery to to try and reflect that. So 
I'll go really quickly through this, but the stuff in blue is essentially things that have been added into the BigQuery to support uh, advanced use cases that are maybe less associated with traditional uh, data warehousing. So real-time capability. This means uh, you may have data that's arriving uh, continuously, uh, arriving fast as a stream. Uh, BigQuery supports this natively. You can pull data uh, directly from a stream into BigQuery, query it in real time. You don't have to bring it to rest somewhere first before you can query it. Uh, when we say centralized storage here, what we mean is really that uh, you should be able to have a single source of truth for all of your data that's going to be used for analytical purposes. And BigQuery can act as that uh, single source of truth because we're providing not only uh, the, the SQL interface, but also um, APIs and different ways of connecting to your data from other tooling uh, like Python and, and Spark and, and other things. Uh, we've built in security and trust from the from the lowest layers of the hardware stack all the way up through uh, uh, the all the layers of uh, of BigQuery, so that you can trust that when you put your data in BigQuery, it is stored uh, securely, um, and and that no one who uh, shouldn't have access to your data can access it. We've also built in uh, data sharing capabilities. So you're able to not only uh, derive insight from your data, but actually share that out with people inside your organization and even uh, people outside the organization. Uh, in the center, we've got um, serverless. And what this really means is that we're sort of replacing the more traditional data warehousing management style, which is, uh, you know, fairly uh, fairly high operational surface area with uh, more of a serverless paradigm. What this means is that you're not managing hardware, you're not managing uh, virtual machines or thinking about how much memory uh, a particular machine needs, um, file formats, things like this. All of that is managed uh, in the fully managed service by uh, Google's SRE team. And finally, uh, most of the time, what the business wants is to sort of be able to say things about what will happen in the future, not only what happened in the past. And so we've added in predictive capabilities in the form of what we call BigQuery ML, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit more in, um, in a little while. So all of this is driven by uh, an architecture that looks like what you see here. So BigQuery is really uh, broken up into a few parts. Uh, inside the gray box, you'll see uh, on the left-hand side, uh, what we're referring to is replicated distributed storage. This is where your data goes. Uh, we'll store your data in a columnar format on a storage that's fully managed by BigQuery. Uh, we automatically uh, keep your data durable across multiple geographies within a, within a continent. If you choose a multi uh, uh, multi um, region jurisdiction. And uh, we're able to access your data at a really, really high speed uh, as a result of optimizations that we apply continuously to your data once you store it in, uh, in BQ. On the right-hand side, we've got our highly available uh, cluster compute. This is um, a, a very highly tuned uh, uh, system that's built specifically to process SQL um, for BigQuery and BigQuery alone. So, this is not um, a bunch of virtual machines, uh, you know, running on sort of commodity uh, style hardware. Uh, this is a very, um, uh, very finely tuned uh, compute resources that can be scheduled on a very highly granular basis to uh, service your queries. And then um, uh, and then you can give those uh, resources back immediately after you're done. Those two bits of infrastructure are connected together by a petabit bisection network. And on that petabit bisection network also exists um, a distributed memory shuffle tier, which we use to uh, persist data uh, in intermediate stages uh, as your queries execute. So um, what this adds up to in the middle here is, uh, is a highly tuned, highly performant um, system that decouples compute and storage, which allows you to really scale these two things completely independently. Um, on the outside of the box, we've got the ways of getting data into BigQuery. Uh, data can be streamed in, as I mentioned uh, previously. Uh, we also provide a bulk loading capability uh, where you're able to bring in uh, data in a variety of formats uh, and, and load those directly into BigQuery, where BigQuery takes care of all of the uh, translation of data types and things like that into BigQuery native types. 
using uh, compute actually that we provide. This is why we call it free bulk loading because it doesn't actually cost you any money to do this. On the outside right hand side are the access mechanisms for, for your data in BigQuery. So we support um, uh, NC SQL 2011. Uh, we are also providing a REST API, a web CLI, um, libraries in uh, seven different languages, uh, ODBC and JDBC drivers, and high throughput connectors that allow you to actually get at your data in other systems like Spark, like Python, like R. Um, the remote memory shuffle is one of the things that I think is really uh, a pretty special piece of, uh, of BigQuery. And uh, this was really uh, uniquely enabling really fast uh, shuffle operations. So shuffle operations are things that have to happen in, um, in MPP style systems. And uh, BigQuery does this about as fast as it can be done through the use of, um, of an in-memory file system that exists to, uh, to handle data in between stages of, uh, of query execution. Okay, so in addition to all the architecture and performance reasons, I'm gonna give you some of the reasons why uh, BigQuery is uh, a really good idea uh, as, as a platform for ELT. And the first reason is that it's actually really easy to get your data in. Um, all that architecture and performance is, is not that meaningful if it's actually difficult to, uh, to get data in there to, uh, to work with it. And so what we provide is, uh, is a set of managed data source providers uh, specifically for uh, Google uh, marketing platform properties and uh, other uh, systems like Google Play. So these managed data source providers can be used to automatically bring uh, your data in from these services into BigQuery so that you can start analyzing your data uh, without any uh, sort of data engineering uh, work. We also support uh, a, a set of automatic data transfers from other systems. Um, specifically, we're picturing here cloud storage. Cloud storage is Google Cloud's uh, object store. So we're able to ingest data directly from cloud storage on an automated basis. Uh, that means we're loading files from cloud storage into, into BigQuery uh, on a periodic basis. Uh, we also support automatic loading from foreign systems like uh, Amazon Redshift and, and S3. Uh, and then finally, one of the main ways that you generate data in, in a system like BigQuery, or especially in an ELT approach, is uh, through query materialization. And to, to make this easy, we provide a simple uh, scheduled query mechanism uh, inside of BigQuery that makes it easy to uh, schedule uh, a query to execute that may materialize uh, uh, a table. Finally, there are, uh, I think, 145 when I last looked, uh, other third-party data sources supported through BigQuery's data transfer service. Uh, we, we put this service on in partnership with, um, with Vivetran and, and Supermetric, who help us pull in data and, uh, and, and land it directly in BigQuery in a form that's uh, ready to analyze. So another reason why BigQuery is great for ELT is because it's extremely flexible. So uh, your data doesn't always just show up in your data warehouse. Uh, even though the transfer services support a lot of different uh, sources, uh, it doesn't necessarily support everything you may want to load. Uh, and so your, your data may come from a variety of other kinds of storage systems. Your data may come from files and cloud storage. You may have something like a NoSQL database, like say Cloud Bigtable, uh, running in your, in your Google Cloud project. Uh, you may be using uh, Cloud SQL as an operational relational database to, uh, to store data for your application. Um, and BigQuery can actually reach out and query all of these uh, using, using standard SQL. And what this gives rise to is, uh, is a pipeline that looks uh, something like this, which you can, of course, orchestrate uh, very easily with data form. So uh, if you're using Cloud SQL as an operational database backing some application, um, you may want to blend that together with data that you receive from partners that you then store on a, on a cloud storage bucket. And you may want to further join that up with data that already exists in your, in your BigQuery warehouse. Because BigQuery supports all of these, uh, either for federated query or for uh, external tables, 
you can blend these sources all together in BigQuery's query engine and then materialize the result of the query to a table in BigQuery's managed storage. And this is one of the things that makes uh, BigQuery really powerful, I think, uh, the fact that we can uh, sort of blur the line between um, something like a data lake paradigm on cloud storage, um, operational databases in cloud SQL, and really bring it all together for analytics uh, inside of BigQuery. Finally, uh, my third reason is uh, BigQuery is a great uh, place to do your ELT because it provides a lot of advanced capabilities that you can access from, from SQL. So the first one I'll call out is, uh, is BigQuery ML. So in addition to your, your the typical joins that you might wanna do with diverse data sets, uh, defining um, say key business metrics, you may also wanna do some sort of predictive modeling. Over, over the data that you're, you're working with. Uh, BigQuery ML enables this by making uh, a number of different kinds of models available for you to use directly from BigQuery SQL. So we're providing models that do uh, classification, segmentation, uh, a few different kinds of regression. Uh, we've got a recommendation uh, engine built in as well, supporting matrix factorization. And then we also uh, will support model import of uh, externally trained models. So if you have a TensorFlow model that you'd like to use to do batch inference over data that's stored in BigQuery, BigQuery ML can enable you to do that. And those BigQuery ML uh, queries can easily be orchestrated uh, through, through Dataform. Uh, BigQuery also supports GIS. So uh, location data is one of the, 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 the fastest growing types of data that, uh, that people are trying to process these days. And uh, it's super useful to have in, available in SQL uh, functions that lets you work with location data. And so BigQuery GIS makes available uh, uh, a number of um, standard ST uh, functions for geospatial processing. These, these functions are uh, extremely similar and share the function signature of, um, of Postgres GIS functions. So this will be familiar to anyone who's used Postgres, uh, PostGIS uh, in the past for processing location data. Uh, and finally, the uh, one of the other big ways that uh, that data management is changing from a more traditional uh, data warehousing paradigm is 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 uh, streaming. Um, the the streaming is becoming a much more prevalent way of receiving data, and uh, I think most of the teams we're seeing have at least one or two use cases that uh, have them receiving data continuously and wanting to uh, process and, and get insights from that data in near real time. And uh, BigQuery enables that through streaming ingestion. Uh, so what you're seeing on the right-hand side is, um, is, a, is a, something of a reference architecture uh, that is pretty common on, uh, on Google Cloud, where we're blending together uh, data that is um, loaded in batches with data that is arriving continuously uh, via, in this case, a system like Cloud PubSub or Apache Kafka. And uh, BigQuery makes this really easy to do because you don't actually have to bring this data to rest before you get it into the data warehouse. Uh, instead, uh, through BigQuery's streaming API, we can receive this data continuously at a rate of um, millions of rows per second per table uh, and, and, and allow you to query over that uh, as soon as the data arrives. So uh, to wrap up, uh, I think there's a, a few really good reasons that, that BigQuery is um, a, a great fit for an ELT paradigm. Uh, one, it's really easy to get your data in, into BigQuery. Uh, we provide transfer services uh, that support um, hundreds of data sources automatically uh, to bring data in. Uh, we have federated capabilities that allow us to query operational data stores on Google Cloud to blend that together with, uh, with a variety of different sources that maybe you make available as external tables to BigQuery. Uh, BigQuery provides um, advanced machine learning and, and, and location handling uh, uh, capability directly in SQL. So uh, analysts who have a, um, a, a great SQL background can uh, do a lot of really advanced things uh, taking advantage of, of the extensions that we've built into BigQuery. 
And finally, streaming ingestion lets you handle all of your streaming sources uh, just the same and, uh, and provide insight back to the business in, uh, in near real time. So that's, uh, that's my time. Um, and I'll hand it back over to, uh, to Dan or Josie to uh, take us to the next section. Vince, thanks very much. Um, I think we can now open the floor to any questions. So if anyone has a question, feel free to just unmute yourself and ask away, or if you'd rather write it in the chat, that's also okay. I actually have a question for Vince on um, so you spoke about you kind of touched on the streaming use case um, can you give an example of of like some teams that you've worked with and what they've used that for uh, sure yeah so um, one that uh, immediately comes to mind is uh, we worked with a team at a, at a telco who um, operates uh, a, um, a website marketing website for one of their one of their brands and uh, the uh, the website has uh, has a tag manager and uh, the way that they get data out of that particular platform is uh, is through a streaming integration that their tag manager telium has with uh, Google Cloud PubSub. and uh, so what they did in that case was uh, use one of our um, uh, what we call our, our, our data data flow templates. Um, so data flow is a uh, is a streaming um, and and batch transformation system that can pull data directly from a variety of different streaming sources and land them into a variety of different sinks. We make available some connectors that make it super easy to do this without code. So they actually deploy uh, this data flow template to pull data off of PubSub, write it directly into BigQuery. Um, and then they blend that with um, with uh, with their marketing activity data, uh, which lives in in other uh, in other BigQuery tables. Um, beyond that, it's uh, it's very common to see more generally uh, people who are using something like Apache Kafka as a common bus for uh, integrating a lot of different systems together. And uh, so we'll see a lot of customers who uh, use. Um, uh, either Kafka Connect or some other system to consume from Kafka, write to BigQuery and then blend that with other data that's uh, li already living in the warehouse. Okay, cool. That makes sense. Cool. We've got a question from Ambrose who said, can you use the query function against Google Sheets too? Yeah, you can. Um, thanks for that. that. I should have I should have added that into the slide. Uh, BigQuery does support Google Sheets as a, as a federated source, so you can create an external table over a Google Sheet and uh, and and query that. Join it with with other data in um, in BigQuery or cloud storage or or cloud SQL. You can go the other direction as well now, right? You can actually query BigQuery from within Google Sheets. Not that it's yes. necessarily, I don't know whether I necessarily would recommend that behavior, but it's but it's available. Yeah, absolutely. And and actually we've um uh we've been improving uh on this uh uh quite a bit over time. So you'll see over time the performance of that of, of actually working with your data uh in sheets from BigQuery uh has has gotten quite good. Anyone else have anything else that they want to ask? It doesn't have to be on the presentation. If there's a question you have for Vince or Dan more generally, feel free to go for it. Cool. Okay. I'll leave it as that then. If no one else has anything to add. Um, Thanks everyone for coming again. I'll be sure to send round a recording of this session um, to anyone who's um, subscribed to the Academy. I'm gonna ping the page in here if you haven't already subscribed to the Academy. 
um, check it out there and check out the webinars that will be running over the next few weeks as well. Um, we'd love to see you all at the ones coming up over the next few weeks as well. So thanks again. And thanks Vince and Dan for um, taking part. Thanks. Cheers. See you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.